Hey guys, what's up? It is week 214, and to start this out, I am going to draw for the Santa Sangre 4K from Severn Films. I had about 80, um, 80 people that entered the contest, um, including the patrons, so I'll show you the list of everybody. I put it in alphabetical order. So we have right here is everybody on the list. There's a couple emails, so I won't get too close. So I have the randomizer set on my phone. We're going to do this right away. I have not done anything. I'll just press the repeat. And whatever number pops up is the winner from 1 to 80. So here we go. Boom. And it is number 59. Let's check who that is on the list. Ugh. Number 59 is Peter Engelin. So I'll show you guys. Congrats. Peter always messages and leaves comments and everything like that. So hopefully you guys can register Peter Englund on there. So congrats. I will send it out ASAP. I believe you're in the Netherlands or Amsterdam, somewhere around that uh, area. Anyways, let's hop into the reviews because there's a bunch of them. And the first one is a new movie and it is Benny Loves You from Epic Pictures. I heard a lot of people talking about this one. It had some pretty decent buzz and um, Epic Pictures, Dread Centrals, they, they are like, uh, they mostly release decent stuff or quality stuff. Most of the time it's not um, poorly done or anything like that. I don't love everything, but I usually give all their stuff a chance. So Benny Loves uh, loves You was right up my alley. It was about a killer doll, but it seemed to be more comical and kind of a puppet kind of deal. So the opening of this film suggests a world where um, your childhood toys that are thrown out or no longer loved will get their revenge. And that's kind of sets up the whole kind of tone and mood of this movie. And the whole movie's got a super weird tone and feel about it, to be honest. Um, so right in the beginning, we have one of those incidents. And then we kind of cut through this uh, middle-aged guy. He's 35. He's not 40. Uh, if you guys have seen the movie, you'll get that joke. And he basically is going through his life. His, he lives alone in a house. Um, his, his parents recently passed. He works at a toy design place, and he's kind of old school. He never grew up. Still has all his childhood toys, including Benny, which is uh, a custom-made bear that he absolutely adores. Even though Benny looks absolutely nothing like a bear to me. I don't know what he looks like. Kind of like an Elmo bear. I don't know what the hell he is. So anyways, one day when he uh, is about to lose his job, lose his house, he decides that he needs kind of a, a change in everything. So he's going to get rid of Benny. That's a big mistake. So after that, um, Benny uh, kind of comes to life and starts to make his life a living hell. But in, in a lot of ways, Benny is his best friend and his only friend, and he has a direct connection with him. So things get completely ridiculous. In a lot of ways, it reminded me a little bit of the remake of Child's Play, um, but it's more comical. And I think it's, it's actually very funny because Benny talks throughout the thing. Um, uh, Benny loves you. Um, he says lots of different things. I know the guys at the Exploding Heads really enjoyed this one, and I enjoyed it for the most part. There is... Um, a weird tone. Like I said, it's not really grounded in reality because lots of strange things happen. Um, and it's just a little bizarre how it plays out. There's a couple gags in here of comedy, which um, one of which I thought was just a little too dark and tasteless for the movie. I, I literally found it a little too disturbing for the, the kind of humor that was in here. And it involves a, a, a dog. And I was just like, I can't believe they did that. And it just it just felt too cruel for me to laugh And it, with this tone of movie. In another movie, it would have worked fine. But it just was a little uh, kind of upsetting, to be honest. It, it's fairly gory. Um, there are some practical effects with guts spilling out and everything. And there's digital effects with Benny, mostly. And they work fine. I thought that they worked really well. Um, yeah, I thought this one was fairly decent and actually kind of heart heartwarming more than fairly just that was pretty good and heartwarming at the very end about a, a man child and his best friend uh, Benny so you really kind of end up siding with Benny even though he is an evil little bastard but there's some good moments here it's very typical and like he has an asshole boss asshole co-worker but Benny's kill count is pretty freaking high so uh check out Benny Loves You from uh Dread Central releasing it's a uh, it's it's a fun little movie and you don't get too many killer doll movies or killer toy movies anymore that are actually decent and I do think there's there's a little bit of love for uh, demonic toys in there with a the little robot character, which is pretty funny. Um, and there is an AIDS robot, which is funny as well in a really on PC way. But I, I, I got to chuck a lot of it. You have AIDS. Um, yeah. Just a little robot saying that. Okay, the next one here is from Arrow Video, or Arrow Films, and this is A Ghost Waits. This is a new movie. I believe maybe it was made in 2019, but wasn't released until 2020 on the streaming channel and all that kind of stuff. 
But okay, this is a very strange movie. Right away when I was watching, and I kind of got the mood or tone of something like Wrist Cutters or Beetlejuice. And I'm a big fan of Beetlejuice, huge fan of that movie. So it's a black and white uh, story about this really lonely guy who fixes up houses and he doesn't even know why he really does it. He just doesn't have anything. Um, he's treated like dirt by all his friends and he's a, a super lonely guy. So he basically is hired to fix up this house or find out why people keep moving out of it. Um, and it turns out that it's haunted and it's also haunted by a very lonely ghost who's been doing it for years and years and years. Um, and, and it's very kind of a typical ghost, like it's black and white. So they have like this real pale paint on and everything in the dark circles under their eyes. But at first he's a little bit terrified. Um, and the ghost seems to be a little intrigued by him when she catches him playing a musical instrument and playing a guitar. And, uh, eventually he realizes that he's not that afraid of the ghost and the ghost is really all that he has. So it, it what blossoms is this really kind of really super cute, touching love story. I ended up really uh, enjoying this one. Um, the music they use in here, the, the what is it? Jeez, the the yellow dress song that is constantly played throughout. I really enjoyed. I, I don't know how to put it this way, and I don't mean this as an insult. And some people may think this is a poo poo on it, but if Saddle Creek Records made a movie like, in like the early two thousands, I feel like it would be this. And I mean that as a compliment because it has that like that sense like that kind of charming sense about it like on the indie real indie feel but it has a lot of heart and uh has good com comedic moments and it's really driven by like two or three people in the entire film i love the lead in here mural uh, Muriel, the ghost. I, I thought she was fantastic. I thought she had a great look. I thought her performance was great. The guy is also pretty solid. I enjoyed his performance, and the chemistry between them is really good as well. So it is a super cute love story that I just really kind of enjoyed. Um, they had a bunch of interviews on here, which I actually did um, check some of them out. There is a bunch of there's a couple audio commentaries, but Humanity and the Afterlife in a Ghost Waits, a new video essay by Isabel Castudio, exploring the film's themes and cinematic forebears, which I really liked in hearing that. They do mention Beetlejuice. They do mentioned tons and tons of ghost stories and everything like that they go in depth i love those little video essays that kind of pull all the stuff before and after and all that kind of stuff that not after but kind of you know it gives a lot of context to what uh, you're watching and it like kind of refreshes your memory on what inspired this movie and other ghost films out there like that there's also a new video essay okay so and then there's also eight interviews with cast and crew moderated by critic and programmer tt stern um th those are actually done on like um geez it's got to be like skype or zoom uh but those are pretty decent um, they actually have a bunch of other stuff on here as well um yeah i actually enjoyed a lot of that so you actually even hear like the 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 director on here he uh and his mom talking about being a production uh like kind of executive producing everything like that so anyways uh this is a directorial debut and i think it's pretty um uh, you know, I, I was pretty impressed with it. Honestly, I enjoyed myself. It, it caught me right away. I thought it was funny. I thought it was cute and it was entertaining. So check it out. A ghost waits. Okay. I'm going to be brief on this because maybe I want to go more in depth later on, but I checked this one out on shutter and how really could I not? It is George A. Romero's amusement park. This is originally made in 1973 and it was not released. It was kind of a lost film. It was kind of made to be like a PSA on, you know, kind of, old people what is it ageism and all that kind of stuff so it stars the lead guy in martin and it opens up with him talking directly to the camera walking around this seemingly abandoned kind of wet damp amusement park and he's talking about all the struggles that old people have to come in contact with and all the things that uh you know the problems with the world and it's funny it's just romero always had his uh, finger on the pulse he was always so ahead of the time and these problems aren't new uh, but it's just kind of like it's stuff that a lot of people don't want to talk about or want to think about because they're eventually going to be old as well and he brings that up so it cuts to this amusement park where it looks like there's a lot of elderly people being taken advantage of here and we follow this one character who it's like a loop story without spoiling too much where we have this man who is beaten down and and horribly kind of scarred up and everything and another old man says do you want to go outside and he just refuses to do anything so this old man ends up going out well i'm going outside i'm going to enjoy myself and throughout society basically it's a big metaphor for how society and life can beat you down how you can feel completely lonely how no one can absolutely care about you and it just keeps beating on you and you have good intentions going out into the world but after you hit a certain point no one cares about you no one takes your side you're you know everybody's just against you and no one really gives a shit and treats you like crap and we have all this kind of stuff in here and although it's not necessarily a horror movie it is kind of horrifying and surreal and just 
just bizarre and it's a nightmare world is what i'll say it's not really even surreal it's just a nightmare world but it just reflects you know uh society as a whole just in this little amusement park there's like a bumper car car accident where no one's going to take the old person's word because hey they're old and no one will take his words because he wasn't wearing his glasses and nobody can be really too sure what he saw george romero's actually in that scene you'll spot bill heinzman uh as well so it's just watching all these old people be completely taken advantage of in here and there's also some a lot of african-american people being taken advantage of and elderly african-american people so it's definitely there it has that look for it was 73 so it has the look of like the crazies and there's always vanilla and martin that 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 certain look that he had from his movies around that time and you you can see it and i always really enjoyed that look from his his 70s 70s film dawn of the dead had the same kind of stock or whatever i feel but uh yeah i also like how he shoots films there's also um I've always loved, I just adore how he edits and shoots his films and stuff like that. But you'll notice like this character in a, a death mask, which I imagine is to represent death and that looming, you know, Grim Reaper figure. But there's a lot going for it, like I said, and uh, it just is really kind of depressing and sad and lots of good stuff in there. So it's an amusement park. It's George Romero. It's everything you could kind of want to see and him, his opinions, like they just stay true. Um, how he has these rich people just eating in front of everybody and like, and just while the poor people have to just feast on, you know, uh, really bad um, noodles and beef. Um, anyways, uh, uh, amusement park, really great stuff. Very interesting stuff, too. And you'll recognize a little music beat in there from Dawn of the Dead, the stock library music. If you're a big fan of that, you'll notice it right away. Ben, dan, 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 dan. Yeah, so I, I really love seeing that. Anyways, uh, also parks and amu like amusement parks and circuses and carnivals and stuff. They're just underutilized in horror, so anything like that, I absolutely adore door uh yeah good stuff okay this next one here i've rewatched for summer series i covered this before and this is it comes at night and i know a lot of people were really upset with this movie though because that advertising made it look like a horror movie i wanted a monster movie well guess what you didn't get that accept it or don't watch it or move on regardless uh people always argue this isn't a horror movie and it's like it's shot like a horror movie there's tons of nightmare sequences in here there's an absolute horrible dread paranoia fear i truly do think this is a horror film and i think it's one of the most bleak horror films in a in a long time it's super bleak so we are in a world where there's some sort of virus that ravaged uh, it's highly contagious in the opening we have a grandfather who's caught it it's kind of an isolated family consisting of uh, a mother father a grandson a dog and the grandfather and he is uh, horribly sick and the grandson is witnessing it he has to help the father and joel edgerton uh, dispose of the body and right there we see the the smoke go up into the sky and we kind of see the credits after they burn the body so like we get this lifestyle that they have the windows are blocked in just making it more full of despair um and they're in the middle of nowhere they you know they basically living on canned foods and like their water and it's just like a, a miserable existence to be honest so one day Somebody tries to break into their house, unknowing that anybody's in there, possibly, and Christopher Abbott. And we realize that he has a family, and they decide to take a chance after being really leery about it and bring his family back to live with them. Christopher Abbott, his wife, um, and a young uh, son. And, and I can't think of the actress's name who plays the wife. She's a very familiar actress, and it's just blanking on me right now. But the acting from all the parties in here is fantastic, especially I, 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 Joel is always great. I mean, he was fantastic in The Gift and everything i've seen him in but um i really love the kid too when he has all these nightmares and everything and these nightmares i think directly play into you know reality and what what's actually happening at certain points but um they hit you where it hurts involving some things which i don't typically want to spoil but man is this ending not one of the bleakest things is this movie just super depressing and it's not super long either it's an hour and a half because you could drag this out to two and a half hour movie and it would just not work like a24 they do a lot of movies that are shorter than you would think and and if they had a long runtime, they would be bad. But since their runtime is short, they have long movies too, don't get me wrong. But stuff like this and um, St. Maud, I think, are basically helped by their short runtime because they're kind of not slow-paced movies. They're movies with dread and impending doom. And it can work in a long movie. Look at Midsommar or, you know, Hereditary is longer. But I feel like 
the the, the short runtime helps this one, and a longer one wouldn't. I, I don't think would make much of a difference, and maybe it would hurt it. But the acting's great, and it's just a, a really paranoid movie. Like you start to catch people say things, that, and you go back and like, did they? Uh, I don't. I, I. It just makes you second guess everything, and you never really know all the answers, which is kind of how it is. You can kind of guess what happened, but you'll never really know. Um, and it's absolutely horrifying because they leave a couple question marks for sure. But anyways, it comes at night. Really powerful stuff. Really well acted. And uh, I love how it's shot, too. It's really well shot and just gives you that sense of dread for sure. Okay, the next one was another rewatch, uh, One Cut of the Dead. Um, I actually watched this not too long ago because I, I actually qualified for 2019, but it was originally released in 2017. So this is a Japanese film. And I don't, like I said, I talked about this before. The movie's been out forever. It's on Shutter with Joe Bob covered it, too. So there's going to be spoilers in this one. So if you haven't seen One Cut of the Dead, which I'm actually shocked you haven't or you haven't had it spoiled for you, fast forward. So rewatching this one, I, I was um, this was one of the ones that I was I liked, but I didn't love, and I didn't include in my top ten originally for 2019, um, I believe. So um, watching this, it is of course three films in one, basically, or basically two. But we have the opening, which is a one shot zombie movie, which. Um, Seems a slightly shoddy, but low budget kind of the stuff that they would make direct to video in like 2005, which I watched a bunch of those for Survive 2005. It would be kind of in that vein, which I always like those somewhat movies. Like, um, so it feels like it's maybe one of those, like a really cheap uh, do-it-yourself zombie movie in one shot. And you'll notice some weird inconsistencies, like characters doing some things. You're like, this is kind of strange. It just seems like it's kind of on the cuff a little bit. But you don't really register that until you watch the entire movie, which makes the first part more enjoyable after you watch it you know, once and you go back and rewatch. So the first half, it's just a short, like 37 minute zombie film, point of view, cheap camera. Um, but it works really well for what it is and how it plays into the film. So after that, it, it's kind of jarring because we cut into like behind the scenes of the director who basically was in the movie as well. Like we we're back, like kind of rewinding and we see his family life and that he is actually going to be hired to make this. And you're like, what, what, what? And then we realize that he was hired to make a, a zombie movie live, make it live, completely live and do it in one shot. And um, there, there's this theme with him that um, he doesn't need to be an artist. He just needs to be good enough. And he always is kind of trying to fight that. And I think a little bit of that with his daughter brings it out too. Because his daughter is big into film. She's always wearing American shirts so like Taxi Driver and those big kind of titles like that. And the wife also had a, a history in film. So we see all these characters, um, a lot of them, that were in front of the camera now behind the scenes and then we see some of the characters that weren't in front of the camera behind the scenes and we're kind of seeing how this whole thing came together to be made which is also interesting and the camera works much better it's a bigger budget it's obviously not shot as like a super low budget movie anymore even though i think this was a student film as whole so then the final part is them actually filming the movie behind the scenes so we see everything come together we see all the things set up in the first part of the second movie how all these characters who they are and everything and and why they end up doing the certain things they do while making the movie so we see part of the making of uh, and then we'll like see behind the scenes and everything like that and it's just kind of a wonderful little picture and it comes together really well um, you know uh, with the love of the father and daughter coming together and of course the crane shot so it's a really entertaining well done movie um, really clever very funny good stuff one cut of the dead okay so the next one from 2017 is tigers are not afraid and this is by Issa Lopez and I watched this one again for 2019 and honestly I must say my biggest regret of my top 10 of 2019 was that this one didn't make it. It should have made it. Like once I rewatched it this time, I was like, that was a huge mistake, Dave. What were you thinking? Why? I know I put a couple movies that I really liked, but probably couldn't have been probably could have switched it out like black forest i could have taken that off which i love and put tigers not afraid on there so um this is a mexican horror film in the vein of a del toro a guillermo del toro for sure um and this is a really great film that feels like it mixes reality with fantasy and horror and i really like that so uh, a young girl right in the beginning we we know that the drug cartel runs this area there's maybe like three brothers but they kind of work for this this guy who's running he's like a po political guy he's a politician but he's a real piece of shit and everybody knows he's crooked nobody really has evidence of it but he runs runs things so right in the beginning the the daughter this young girl is like main character here um she has to get down on the ground um, and during school, there's a bunch of shooting and the teacher's trying to comfort her and says, make three wishes with these chalk pieces of chalk. And that kind of starts this fantasy or maybe it wasn't fantasy at all. And 
there's this red line of blood following her throughout the entire film. She goes home, her mother's not there, and she's completely left alone. She ends up trying to join this group of young kids, these young boys who are living on their own, whose parents have disappeared, probably due to the cartel as well. Um, so it seems like the cartel kills who they want, takes what they want, all that kind of stuff. So she joins the cartel, and through a series of events, they believe that she actually committed a murder, and that kind of puts her at the top of the um, the heap in her, in her group of friends, um, or her gang, or whatever like that, her survivors. And that brings attention obviously to other criminals including the two brothers um that are still left so um they also have a cell phone and a gun that was stolen the young boy stole and they want a hold of that cell phone but throughout there's these these fantastical elements where they hide out at the school and they see all these fish um within like the broken down school which isn't necessarily fantastical or unreal but it's just kind of surreal and awesome at the same time just like a little bit of that magic actually seeping into the real world even though that is believable what's there but we also have these graffiti drawings that the kids draw and everything like that and they're telling the story of the tiger the tiger cannot be afraid and they are the tiger and all this kind of stuff um and it's just really kind uh, really well done and i am a sucker for movies that end in narration this one does it it does it beautifully um and it also doesn't pull its punches it's brutal it's violent people die and people die that you care about and it just really hits you in the gut really hard and um like i said there's some really horrific imagery too people wrapped in plastic standing up and and it's just it's a ghost story too it's a revenge story um which I really liked, Revenge Beyond the Grave with the help of someone. Uh, yeah, this is a great film. It's 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 also important, I think. It also points out things that are really troublesome with the world. Uh, and it's just sad, but also super well made. Uh, Love Tigers Are Not Afraid, great stuff. Okay, uh, I think last week I asked, or maybe it was the week before, what is the worst horror film from 1970? And um, Troy Howarth answered, who does great commentaries and books and everything, and he said Trog. See, I bought this from Big Lots a long time ago for $3 as a slit uh, uh, proof of purchase. But I watched an HD version of it online. So Trog has an HD version out there. No, no Blu-ray yet, I don't think. But Trog. Oh, boy. This is directed by Freddie Francis. It stars Joan Collins. You'll recognize Michael Gow. Um, David Warbeck is also in here. Um, and a couple other uh, Hammer alumni, including Thorley Walters from Vampire Circus and a slew of other things. He's a fantastic actor. So, yeah, it's got a nice cast. Um, basically, what I felt about this movie is when bad movies were enjoyable. like, And this still is. This is an absolute ridiculous movie. Joan Collins is this science, uh, I don't remember what her, orthopology, whatever it is. She studies evolution and all that kind of stuff. I, I, In movies like this, I never remember what their actual degree is in or anything like that. I'm just like, they're a scientist, who cares? Leave, leave the uh, details for somebody else. Anyways, um, basically through uh, Discovery, these three people are exploring this cave. They go under the, um, the water and they discover this kind of weird, um, kind of preserved area. Um, the 10 minutes into this movie, Trog is shown, and I laughed out loud, hysterically. Trog attacks, um, he's a troglodyte, of course, the missing link is what Joan Collins thinks he is. And I say troglodyte or missing link because there's, the, the way the monster looks, he's one of the saddest attempts at a monster. That's why I put it in quotations. So, okay, Trog here. They show him, and he's supposed to be the missing link, of course, right? And instead of, you know, making him like ape all the way around, like more hairy body, they put this ape head on him that has like this animatronic mouth and eyes and stuff. I think the eyes are his, but the mouth moves and everything. So it's just an ape head, right? And it like brings some fur down to his shoulders. And then it's just a guy, torso. He has like little underwears on that he made, like Master Universe underwear and little boots that he made. And it's just like... I don't understand if they think evolution works like the fly like monster in like the fifties, like where, Oh yeah. Like here's, here's what happens to you. Like when you're, you're changing over millions of years, like, Oh, for now you're just going to have a head of an eight, but you're going to have the body of a man instead of just like, it's completely nonsense. Like it just made me laugh hysterically how Trog looked, but of course Trog is captured. Trog is to be studied. Joan, um, is it? Yeah. Joan, geez, Joan Crawford, not Joan Collins. Jeez. I always get those two names mixed up, but Joan Crawford from all the, uh, what a, whatever happened to Baby Jane and all those movies like that. So, duh, sorry, not Joan Collins, not Joan Collins at all. Um, 
So basically, Joan Crawford wants to study Trog and starts a relationship with them. And there's a lot of seeds of him playing with toys that are absolutely hilarious. And Trog, when he attacks, is, is great. In the very beginning, he runs kind of amok. But Michael Gao is the most piggest piece of shit ever. I, here's what. I watched Horror of Dracula with him and Berserk, with I think also has Joan Crawford in it. So I think she's in that, yeah. And he's in, of course, you know, the Batman movies and some other things like this. But he always, to me, plays such a slimy bastard. In this movie, he's a fellow scientist or some kind of guy. I don't remember what he is, but he's obviously upset. He's a chauvinistic asshole. He doesn't think that women should be doing anything. And he's constantly in, like, all these hearings um, trying to talk bad about Joan Crawford and get the trog uh, executed and everything like that. But regardless, he is just such a snarky little shit in this movie that um when he dies which i'm going to spoil i was so happy i was like this guy should have an elongated rip-off head scene but anyways of course you know where this is going people don't understand trog trog just wants to live a life and he's misunderstood we can learn so much from him but trog's gonna run amok right all eight guys in ape suits run amok and what's funny is like you look at something like shellac which came out a couple years later making fun of movies like this and shellac is almost as believable as trog I mean, uh, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's not that far off, okay? So there, at the end, when Trog does run amok, there is a scene involving a hook in a butcher shop. And I was like, I know what you're doing, Toby Hooper. I, I know where you got that for Texas Chainsaw. You got it from Trog. Um, there's parts where the car is flipped over and just explodes for no reason. And not a hard flip over, just a, just a little tough up over it just explodes. Where tranquilizers are shot out of a, a rifle and they, they sound like gun bullets boom it's like it's a tranquil what the what's going on um yeah i don't really know what to say about it it's hilariously bad it's super cheesy it's goofy uh trog is one of the worst monster designs of all time even though his face is good it's acceptable but the movie is enjoyable for me i laughed i enjoyed it it's goofy it's silly i can't recommend it but i did not hate my time with Trog, to be honest. Like I said, watching a bad movie from 2005 was hell. Like Death Tunnel, it's just trash. There's nothing there. There's no actors. There's no editing. There's just nothing. There's not even a light. Like I just, a miserable experience in general, and it's a whole. But when you watch a bad movie from 1970, whether it's Trog or Janie or something like that, at least there's something. At least it's on film. At least it's good looking to a certain extent. Um, so Trog, um, I enjoyed it as bad as it is. I'm not going to give it a recommend. It's a bad movie, but it's very entertaining. And it's funny, Freddie Francis did another movie this year called, um, what is it, like, uh, Good Night. Uh, it's like Girly, Girly, Girly. And the long name is like Girly Mumsy Daddy, whatever the hell that long name is. But Trog, yeah. Okay, the next movie. Speaking of bad 1970 movies, I'm going to talk about Janie, um, which had like three directors on it. One of them was Roberta Finley and her husband, Michael Finley. Um, and somebody else as well. So, okay, um, if you guys aren't familiar with Roberta Finley, she did two from 85, The Oracle, and Tenement. It's a place to live. Tenement. Every time I hear the song, I have to do it. She also did a couple other ones like Lurkers and Primeval and a bunch of porn films. And Janie is more, to me, a softcore porn film than a horror film. So I didn't really know what the hell to expect. It's listed as horror everywhere. So um, Janie is narrating. So Janie is this weird character that uh, basically hates society. We know this because she's narrating throughout the entire film, and it sounds like a completely different actress than the one we see on camera. I wonder if it's Roberta Finley herself narrating. It sure sounds like her. She's also in the movie. But she's just like, I hate people. They're really stupid and gross, and I hope they all die. So Janie, what she does is, in the, it's kind of a weird kind of structure here. She's in bed with her stepfather or father, like, like they just had a night of steamy sex or something like that. Really gross. And she's telling him, I think it's father, telling him all these people she killed. And he doesn't really seem to believe it. Telling these, these relaying these stories about a guy she swam in his pool that she killed or a couple that she ran over with a car. And she's just a miserable, awful person. And it's also like edited into a weird, surreal thing. Like where they had like 30 minutes of footage and somehow they're like, we got to get this at least an hour. So like they started cutting it to super weird ways and making it trippy, but it really just feels like it's a lack of footage or a lack of a complete movie to try to complete a movie. But some of that trippy stuff, I guess is decent. 
it. Um, I, I just can't really say much about this one. It's dirty and weird and gross, but also just kind of stupid and uh, not very well done. Uh, you know, Roberta Finley has some long arguments with Janie at certain points when she shows up. And, and the lady who plays Janie, I believe she is someone important. I mentioned she's a softcore porn star or something like that. But there's plenty of nudity, nothing below the waist, but lots of softcore sex scenes and, and, and boobage going on. I can't really recommend Janie. It might have some interest to be like in a weird acid world thing or something like that, but I can't. It's not very good. It's probably my least favorite from 1970 so far. Okay, the next one from 1970 is definitely a hidden gem. It is a German film called Jonathan. And for my research, a little bit I did do, eh? it seems like there's two versions of this. I watched the hour and a half version, but there seems to be an hour and 50 minute version. I'm not 100% sure. I don't, I, I really couldn't uh, find it or anything but this is a period piece this is a super strange film and i'll say like the filming techniques the camera work and stuff and don't don't directly compare it to this what like i'm gonna do it's not as elaborate or maybe as effective as something like hard to be a god the russian film or come and come uh come and see which is also a fantastic movie like i think also a russian movie it feels like that that kind of like that camera that keeps moving and doing a lot of elaborate things i feel like jonathan has that style in the camera work so what we have here is is, and it's a world where vampires exist. Um, they're led by, I believe, a guy named Jonathan. I think he's the lead vampire, not the lead hero. But um, so he has this castle with all these vampires and human protectors and everything, and he's very dangerous. And people have been getting killed and tortured and mutilated by the, the by these vampires for a long time. And there's kind of like a last hope ditch to take them out. So uh, the townsfolk at this one small village get together and they decide that we need to send someone there to kind of scope the area out, free the prisoners, and attack Jonathan and his vampires. So basically we follow this character as he goes across the countryside, beautiful camera work, and he kind of runs into all these other people that are out to get him, some working for Jonathan, of course, and he goes across this village um, that has been ransacked and just messed up, and this whole scene is really screwed up. Like we see like slaughtered livestock and we come around and and this one shot and we see like a nun who had hung herself um or hanged herself i'm never sure which one it is but i just was like oh boy that's some powerful stuff for a 1970 horror film like it just kind of reflected something like it reminded me of come and see not as as disturbing as that but just a lot that one shot in particular i thought was fantastic but uh, we kind of follow this guy as he goes to jonathan's castle and uh, sees all the vampires we see some of the rituals and the things they do and they have this very uh great like folky feeling full core kind of feeling and we see like this room where they take all the crosses that people have there's lots of good stuff going on in here like i can't recommend it enough there is one real hit on the movie that bothered me there's some animal cruelty involving uh, a rat i mean I, there's so like, dead livestock I, they didn't show that get killed on screen so i don't know how what it was for or what it was prepared for or anything but the the murder of the rat on screen it's not like a cannibal apocalypse where it's set on fire or something or wild in the streets where it's it's brief this is pretty nasty where one of the henchmen literally just stomps a rat until its head is paced and you're just like geez and he doesn't get it the first time he stops it like two or three times before the rat's dead it's just as unpleasant as shit and kind of surprised me that it was in there considering i mean the movie had some bleak stuff it just was a really weird scene and i know they're cool but it was kind of unneeded and i don't want to hold the movie to uh 2021 20, standards but i'm just let people know that it is in there and it is bothersome but hey uh Anyways, I just was really kind of impressed with this movie as a whole in, in terms of filmmaking and uh, cinematography and staging and all that stuff. And the ending was awesome, too. It gets pretty big. And I hadn't heard many people talk about it, but it's got a great gothic feel, period piece. Just awesome stuff. Um, really loved it. Another hidden gem. That, that's I mean, I've watched movies I like, but I would say this is the third hidden gem along with um, The Wolf in the Woods, a.k.a. The Anson's Woods. I don't know how to say Anson's. So Wolf in the Woods, The Strangler. And this one, I think they're all fantastic, great movies and contenders for a top 10, to be honest. So I'm already, I've only watched 10 1970 movies and I'm, I'm on a streak. I'm loving it so far. Maybe when I get to 70, I won't be loving it, but sure as a hell on a better streak than 2005 already. So yeah, check this one out. You won't, I don't think you'll regret it. Okay, the next one here is The Females, or Carnivore Feminine, or Feminine Carnivore, and it's got a couple other names, Dai Workabigan Chin. Yeah, I'm just going to go with The Females, 1970, of course, um, and I think this is a French one, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's German. I think it might be German. Uh, sorry, yeah. So this is a super bizarre movie. Um, 
got to be a feminist movie, possibly. I don't know, because there's a lot of nudity at the same time. Like, those movies that have, like, in the 70s, Euro horror, it had, like, the 70s style, like, um, like nudity and everything like that. But they had, like, these positive, like, like strong women characters and everything like that. So this is a weird freaking movie. It reminded me a lot of the um, one that Severn Films put out a little ago, the French film called Shock Treatment, not to be confused with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Not a sequel, not a prequel. It's an equal um, Shock Treatment. But it, it reminded me a lot of that Shock Treatment French film where they're kind of stranded at this this resort for rich people and everything, and they're doing things they shouldn't be. So uh, essentially this woman, uh, she's sent to this resort that is filled with all these different kind of women. They all introduce themselves. And uh, very quickly she realizes something's not right there's three guys that are in this town this whole town as women it's all ran by women it's all ran by the females and so there's a couple guys that end up stopping by and they're instantly seduced and there's this very strange things that people are being fed you don't need to be put two and two together when it's called feminine uh, carnivore um so it's it's uh basically a cannibal film and it's kind of like eating the man and everything like that. She starts to dig deeper and we make some obvious things towards a prey manis, some kind of some similes between a prey manis and what they do with their um, significant other in quotations uh, before or after sex. So we have that whole thing going on. There's a couple really good scenes, one involving a pool, which I thought was pretty cool. This is kind of a weird trippy movie too. Like there's lots of crazy bizarre stuff going on. And for 1970, I, I thought it was a, a pretty solid movie. I enjoyed myself. There's a a, a cool scene where the the people from this town end up going to like this big feminist meet and there's like they're like confused at what it is and there's like all these like people dancing on stage and it's kind of a bizarre thing it's like definitely a carryover from the 60s kind of hippie culture stuff going on too anyways i thought this one was interesting as hell um and of course you know you're always trapped in this small town i feel like evil town is very similar to that too there's it's not a new thing you can't get out of this resort everybody's in on it maybe you're crazy maybe you're not i don't know maybe they're eating the people maybe they aren't i don't know maybe they're a weird secret cult that is feasting on men probably i mean that's what the title would suggest um but that is the females yeah good stuff okay this next one here's another one from 1970 and this is count yorga uh the twilight time release i also have the arrow release with part one and two in there but count yorga so um i never seen count yorga it was one i always wanted to watch i should watch the sequel too but uh 1970 starring robert quarry um and there's another name in here and i'll beat myself up if i don't pop it michael murphy yep michael murphy is in here from shocker and uh strange behavior um <laughs> two weird movies to name for him uh but yeah so we have count Yorga Vampire. Or, yeah, yeah. I wanted to make sure it wasn't Vampire Count Yorga. Count Yorga Vampire. So, um, the first act of this movie was uh, a little bit slow for me. I'm not going to lie. I don't mind slow movies. I thought it was a little lackluster. But we have um, Count Yorga showing up to this weird party. These, these kind of, like, young people are, like, doing this weird seance. And... They want to communicate uh, with, I think the girl's mother passed and Count Yorga was a friend of hers. So they want to communicate with her at this seance. And Count Yorga is a super bizarre guy. He's older than them. He's just mysterious. Well, he's a goddamn vampire, right? He's Count Yorga the vampire. So um, anyways, what happens is they have a mysterious kind of, inter this whole thing is really messed up. And a couple of them are driving home. They drive the Count home. They get stuck. I believe that's what happens. And the Count feeds on them. And they don't really know what happens. And the movie kind of picks up um, where there's a scene where somebody's feasting on a kitten where they come home. And I was like, oh, now, now we're in business. But uh, the best part of this movie is... One of the characters suspects Count Yorga of being a vampire and he's trying to stall him until daylight comes up. And the interaction that he has with Count Yorga is wonderful. It's awesome. And it's just like this cat and mouse, like only in a talkative way that I love, like a conversation where he's like, well, I need to be getting to go, going to bed. And he's like, are you sure? I'm really interested in this subject. And that whole part was really great. I've never seen anyone try to stall a vampire to stay up to, make, to check if they're a vampire. But that stuff was really well done. And the ending is freaking downbeat. Like, it's a downbeat movie. Ooh, I didn't really know what to expect. Robert Corey's great in it. He's a, he's great. And that in particular, that conversation really won me over on this movie. Good movie. I don't love it, but I'm definitely interested in checking out the sequel. And I did enjoy it. So, yeah, it's cool stuff. And Robert Corey, I know from um, Dr. Fives Rises Again. He's kind of the uh, the guy going against Fives. He's his, um, I don't want to say, not his colleague, but he's his enemy in that one. He's an arch nemesis, if you will. Okay, and the last one for 1970 is... I drink your blood. 
I eat your skin, even though it's just I drink your blood. I mean, hearing that trailer so many times and hearing that, you just have to say both of them together. This is the Grindhouse releasing version. It includes the original theatrical uncensored version, and it also includes the director's cut, which puts back four scenes and makes the ending more downbeat. The quality on those uh, scenes is not as good as the other print, but hey. This is 1970, directed by David Dernson, and David Dernson worked on a couple of movies before this. He wasn't a too big of a horror fan or a gore fan or any exploitation fan but boy oh boy did he make one of the most infamous exploitation films of all time so uh, if anybody doesn't know the plot of i drink your blood let me run this down um right in the beginning um he got the idea because a group of people in iran got rabies a bunch of kids and the charles manson cult of course 1969 1970 this was released in 71 but made i think 70 in festivals it counts as 70 so anyways what it is, is there's a group of hippie Satanists, um, which are passing through this small kind of rundown town that's only run downtown that's only open for miners and, and construction workers and everything like that. There's only basically a bakery and a veterinarian still around. So what happens is these Satanists do some awful things to this young woman. And through a series of revenge, somebody gets a bunch of rabies and some meat pies. These Satanists eat meat pies. They go completely batshit crazy rabies spread everywhere so it's completely nuts originally called phobia uh from watching the features which makes a little bit more sense but then we wouldn't have the title i drink your blood um which is super infamous to me um and there's a lot of iconic scenes in this movie some of the hippies have some of the best faces and they have some really memorable scenes there's one where um this one construction worker has a great face he's this big big guy holding the head and that's a me very memorable scene the african-american hippie is super great in this one he's got a great look and he's just drooling carrying that axe and of course they're all agoraphobic because uh, they hate the water because they are hydrophobic sorry not agoraphobic that's when you won't leave your house hydrophobic is when you're terrified of the water when you have rabies according to i drink your blood um so yeah uh, it just a lot of the hippies are really memorable lynn lowry is one of the hippies and she's mute and she has a great scene involving a carving knife electric carving knife and the lead hippie is just this really crazy indian guy satanist guy um this movie pushes a lot of buttons like i mean for 19 1970 there was a lot of nudity like you see the pubes right in the opening of the uh the cult leader i was like wow i didn't ex i don't remember seeing pubes in that scene and you see a lot of like bare butts and breast um uh, maybe there's not that many breasts but anyways it has like some sexual nature i remember the the one dude chasing somebody buck naked through the woods um and the gore although it is dated of course it's got that paint color blood it, there's you know heads getting hacked off feet getting hacked off um, intestines kind of spilling out people getting pitchforked so it's gory for the time i feel like this movie i don't again everybody's like you gotta say something bad about Herschel gordon lewis like if Herschel gordon lewis cared about his movies it had a little bit more money they might have turned out like this and i i really like i drink your blood so that is a compliment like i know he's working on a much lower budget but this one just works for me i like the rabid feel, the rabid feel like you know and it's funny that lynn Lowry would go on to do the crazies and shivers and and uh crazies has some similarities to this one as uh the director pointed out himself which i thought was fun um it's loaded with features i actually did get a chance i watched the um i didn't watch the i eat your skin which is infamously bad um, by Del Tenney and Blue Sextit, um, Sex Sexton, which is another movie he directed on here. But I did uh, check out some of the special features on here, which, um, geez, where is it? Um, it was uh, ported over from the old disc where he interviewed some of the stars in there, and we kind of hear why um, I Drink Your Blood, I Ate Your Skin, and how it was packaged together and stuff. And then there's an hour-long interview with him on here, which is really interesting because he came from old Hollywood. He had a long career as like directing some plays, directing some movies early on, and then all that kind of stuff, even acting. So him breaking everything down was really entertaining and interesting, and he had a lot of good stories. He's since passed. 2010 is when he died, and I think those features were made probably in like 20, 2006, 2005, or somewhere around that time. I don't remember when i originally bought the grand house releasing dvd i thought the print looked really good um for what it is i mean this movie is very low budget 1970 and i think this one's really ahead of its time it of course was one of the first pictures maybe the first picture to ever get an x for violence although i thought they were threatening the wild bunch with an x as well but uh yeah this is like kind of grindhouse exploitation royalty i think everybody should watch this one if you haven't and it was really fun to rewatch it um rabid meat pies man i love it um crazy Sa satanist hippies and construction work 
berserkers drooling, killing everybody they come in sight with. Um, there is a, a lot of rumors of animal cruelty, and there is some rats put out on a fire, but my understanding is he explained that those rats, they ordered them from a lab, and they were already dead, and they ordered them frozen, and they put them on the fire. Um, the goat that is dead in the film was actually... Um, had to be put down because it was carrying a disease. And a lot of times at farms, if an animal does is diseased, they will put it down so it doesn't affect the other animals because it's game over for everything at that point. And the chicken in the beginning, I believe, was eaten. Although it's still unpleasant as hell to watch a chicken be beheaded and a, its throat slit and everything like that. But um, I can get over a chicken a little bit easier than a goat and <laughs> burning things like that. So anyways, uh, a great movie with a lot of features. If you don't have I Drink Your Blood or you haven't seen it, I know it's kind of a one that one of the heavy uh, hitters for 1970. But check it out. I really enjoy it, especially if you're an Exploitation Grindhouse fan. It's a must. It's, uh, it's kind of on the top tier of those movies for me to be honest it's one that comes to mind right away along with like the last house on the left and the text chainsaw massacre in terms of exploitation films and and that grindhouse kind of drive-in feel for sure that's i drink your blood okay here is the patreon pick and it is also the weekly western let's go Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. picked by tone joker and you're wondering why it's sealed how could i have watched it because i watched it on tubi it is the legend of the lone ranger i watched it on tubi this movie is almost over i hit the order button on amazon and it came before but i watched it on tubi it is the legend of the lone ranger and it's 81 82 and first and foremost let me get this through i don't know much about the lone ranger i know the old show uh kimosabi and tanto and them but i don't have any connection to it so if the source material is completely destroyed in this movie it's not going to bother me as long as the movie's entertaining. So uh, the Tone Joker basically told me, he said, yes, it's kind of a kid's movie, but it's super violent. So I was like, okay, I'm expecting kind of a kid's film. Right in the first 20 minutes, I was like, this is violent as hell. We basically have the uh, kind of origin story of the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Um, he saves Tonto from a bunch of baddies, and then these same baddies kind of murder his family. So Tonto takes him in as a young boy. He eventually is sent away by his older brother when he finds him, and he has to go live somewhere else. He returns to this small town. His brother is a Texas Ranger, and um, he becomes a Texas Ranger fairly quickly. But there is a corrupt, crazy major in Christopher Lloyd who takes out all the Texas Rangers, except him. He barely survives. Due to Tonto's help, Tonto finds him, and these two start working together again to get rid of this crazy major, uh, what is his name, played by Christopher Lloyd, who plans to kidnap the president, um, Ulysses S. Grant, played by the wonderful Jason Robars. So yeah, that's a pretty crazy plot there. Uh, anyways, I really enjoyed this. I couldn't believe in the first 15 minutes, there's like all these people riding in a stagecoach and one of the guys is like, I'm here to make money and he immediately gets shot and dies. Um, one guy gets like, he's jumping on the stagecoach and he gets on the horses and they show him get crampled by the horses underneath. Um, people are getting hung. I was just like, man, or, or shooting firing squad and everything like that. Christopher Lloyd's great in it. He plays a great villain, great asshole. Um, 
of Jason Robards is fantastic. You get to see um, Richard Farnsworth as he's he, he's Wild Bill uh, Hickok in here. There's also cheese uh, um, Wild Bill Hickok and who is it? Buffalo Bill. Jesus Christ, what's the other guy's name from years ago um, when they got Colonel uh, Custard in here? And oh, geez, what is the other classic guy? Um, it's not Jim Bowie, but is it? Ah, oh, man, I'm missing like these other guys. I'm confusing all these people from the old West Frontier times. But uh, Richard Farnsworth plays Wild Bill Hickok. It's just a really pulpy, goofy, but very entertaining and fun and surprisingly violent. Like squibs are going off. People are getting shot. There's tons of explosions. It never stops. And it uses a lot of the classic Western songs, which I believe probably were used in the television show as well. Um, I didn't see their redo that was made um, in their like a few years back with Johnny Depp. I didn't see that one. And like I said, I'm not super familiar with the show. I might have caught an episode here and there as a kid. Just I know the Lone Ranger and the pop culture references and the zeitgeist, but I don't really have any connection to it except that it's just an old show. So watching this, I didn't really have any complaints and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it was very entertaining and I haven't watched just a pulpy, fun Western in a long time. Brimstone I watched last week. Not fun. Great, but not fun. This I just enjoyed myself. Um, the the two leads are cheesy. Uh, you know, The two lead people are very corny and cheesy. Um, but the slaughter of the Texas Rangers was brutal way more brutal than I expected um, but yeah good stuff um, very entertaining uh, very cheesy but hit the spot for me it's a legend of the Lone Ranger deserves got nothing to do with it when you have to shoot shoot don't talk Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage the Undead. Oh. What? You ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead? No, I guess I must have missed that one. You ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. I seen way more than you. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, Casino, Cannibal Holocaust, The Beginning, The Great Escape, Kelly's Heroes, Once Upon a Time in the Fucking West. You haven't seen War and Peace. Pink Flamingos, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane, The Alvin and the Chipmunks Christmas Special. You haven't seen, hmm, what else haven't you seen? The Magnificent Seven? The Magnificent Seven Ride Again? The Magnificent Seven Are Back? Is that a movie? And last of all, you ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead. And you haven't seen War and Peace. I ain't watching War and Peace. The hell you are? Fuck War and Peace! All right, we're here to do Bly... Uh, <laughs> it's not Blind Spot. It's not Blind Spot. It's You Ain't Seen. This was your pick. Yeah. And it was... What? You're going to have to take over. I don't know anything about this. I can't oh. just fucking bullshit my way through like movies I know what I'm talking about because I don't know anything about musicals. I don't know anything about typically too many musicals except horror-oriented ones or ones that I've seen, which isn't many. This is the Pirates of what? Penzance? Pirates of Penzance. Is you sure about that? It 19... sounds like there's a question there. 1983 is when this movie was made. Was released. Was released. Maybe it was made a little bit earlier. It's based off a musical opera of the 1980s. And there was actually one, a TV version, that's just like a recording of a live uh, Broadway, or it was off-Broadway, um, that was released. It had pretty much a lot of the same cast, three or four of the same people in here, including mm -hmm. Kevin Kline, um, Linda Rodstand, and, uh, geez, uh, George Rose, and the leader, the, the constable. So, Angela Lansbury was the only uh, switch out. Yes. Uh, from my understanding. So basically, this is a period piece pirate musical. Mm -hmm. It runs a little less than two hours long. Um, it's it's got to be very popular. The song that everybody will remember from this is Major, what I am a modern, Major General. I know all the things. <laughs> Go ahead. Scientific. Yeah. And vegetable and mineral. Animal and mineral. Animal and mineral. Okay, so <laughs> I don't even know how to go about the plot. Uh, what is the plot? Oh, so, so, um,. The plot is, is a boy who was raised by pirates, finishes his apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Yeah. Apprenticeship. Um, comes to land and meets uh, young women and falls in love with one of them. And then he finds out that, um, you know, he's going to marry her. And he's going to do in those pesky pirates once and for all. Because um, his allegiances have changed. But then it finds out, oh, you were born 
in a leap year on February 29th, and so you are not 21 years of age, you are five. And so therefore, you are technically still a pirate, so come back to us. Well, the lead character here is a young man who is accidentally apprenticed to a pirate instead of a pilot. He was, uh, this is because his um, caretaker mistakenly signed him up for that. And at 21 years, he's released from his apprenticeship. He has actually disdained the pirate lifestyle the entire time. And the band of pirates he's with are very angry on the exterior, but they're really soft on the interior. They're actually kind of very bad, poor, lackluster pirates who will let anyone go if they say they're an orphan or have any shred of humanity that they can relate to. Uh, Kevin Klein is the leader of the pirates, and uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. The lead character is young, and he's duty-bound, so matter if he is very conflicted character when he finds out it's a leap year, so it complicates things. So he has allegiances, obviously, to the woman he loves, that loves him and her father and the pirates, so it's kind of a ridiculous uh, back and forth. It's not a violent movie. There's not really any action. It's all very adventure, goofy funness. It's not even really an adventure movie. It's more just straight up musical and comedy. It's um, slapstick. Yeah, there's a lot of good gags in here, especially the orphan often gag where you misunderstand. That's always very funny. See Abbott Costello, who's on first base, if you like that kind of humor. It's been done a lot. It always works for me. Uh, a lot of visual uh, gags that are very funny where Angela Lansbury, who plays um, the caretaker um, and is in love with the young man, and Kevin Klein are trying to convince him of something, and he is completely torn, and he's running back and forth, and they're following him, and then at one point they run back and forth without him, thinking they're still holding on to him, and then realize they don't have him anymore, and they're like, ah, it's that sight gag, basically, in the Looney Tunes cartoon, where they don't realize they're falling, and then they look down, and they're falling, kind of like they're running, yeah. and just in a motion, and then they realize they don't have what they're supposed to, a little different than that, but kind of in the same vein. Oh, yeah, I found it very funny. I thought Kevin Klein was pretty much the the outstanding part mm -hmm. of it, but there was a few. Um, the leader of the constable, the constable's moved perfectly his limbs were actually fantastic and they're all very much charlie chaplin impersonators mm -hmm. which is kind of funny they all move like that and everything like that um yeah so it was very cute the pirates were everybody was very good in it um i love the general the song and everything like that um it's just i i wasn't familiar with the stage play so i have nothing to compare it to or off broadway or on broadway would mm -hmm. ever play a version of it so basically just watching it for the first time i liked the sets quite a bit the the matte paintings were really good, too. The yeah. matte paintings were spectacular. Um, at the very end, the throwing of the hats was extra cheese-tastic, <laughs> and I could have probably done without that, but it doesn't really affect the movie at all to, for me. I, I really don't have very much more to say unless you want to get into some details. Um, well, we can get into some details. Um, the music, I think, was fantastic. Yeah. I love nearly every song in it. Um, I, I tend to like, when I'm watching these, because I tend to like numbers of like large cast singing. Um, you know, and, and this one has a lot. It has a you know. Not so many solo numbers or even duet numbers, but lots of like like trios or ensemble pieces or dueling songs. Yeah, dueling like, songs. It's almost like that mid song in uh, uh, mid, uh, La Mez where it's very typical that they have one of these in every play where they have like the dueling songs and they finally come together yeah. as this big kind of chorus, I would say. And this right. one has just like five or six of those. Maybe the whole thing is that, except for the love ballad kind of between. Um, Frederick and I don't remember the Mabel. Mabel. I think it's Mabel. Yeah, it is definitely Mabel. Yeah. It's, I should have mentioned before somebody, because every time I do one of these reviews and I don't mention a certain actor or actress or somebody like that, there's always somebody that sends like a paragraph, which, and I understand completely, that's fine. Um, and then they're like, like I don't know who they are, but Linda Ronston obviously was a musical musical star. And the song that I know is You and Me Travel to the Beat of a Different Drum was the, I think, the, the hit that comes to mind for me. I'm sure mm -hmm. she has numerous other songs. Um, and a lot of people probably like, well, she had this, 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 this. She's all also in this, this, and this, and yes, right. I'm aware that she is a famous person. Right. Um, a lot of the, <laughs> most of this cast was the original Broadway yeah. cast, um, and even um, when you're watching the credits and, and you'll see them, like, they'll have a character casted, um, and they did the, the fit, like, the actual acting on screen. And there's a musical number. The musical the numbers were sung by the Broadway cast. Um, so this one isn't done like uh, the... 2012 Les Mes, where it was like shot live and recorded live. It, it is a dubbed. Um, well, some of them actually sung it. Some too, of them though. actually sung Kevin it. Kevin Klein too. was singing, right? Oh, yeah. well, yeah. Well, Kevin Klein is yeah. one of the original. Yeah, so he was singing it too. And right. Was but Angela Lansbury too, if she had to be. But yeah, she's yeah. not an original, is she? No. She is not original Broadway, but she was. That was actually her singing. Um, there was just like like very, like some of the daughters, some of the pirates were, and constables were, um, you know, like. The, the the voices were, were the Broadway cast, but the um, 
the actual people on screen were, were just minor actors. Yeah. Um, Angela Lansbury, I think, is fantastic. I don't think she's as good in this as she is in Sweeney Todd. As she is like in that, Sweeney yeah. Todd, um, but I always adore her. Um, I, I think I've loved everything she's ever been in, um, and you can tell that she's having a lot of fun. I mean, she is in her fifties in this, yeah. um, which which was quite funny because <coughs> she's born in nineteen twenty five and she's still alive at ninety six. Right. She seems she's one of those people like Telly Savalas or Leslie Nielsen. It's like I've never seen them young, and even when they were young, I'm pretty sure they looked old. But right. they don't look bad old. They always look very good for their age because you always think they're a hundred. Well, I, I've seen <laughs> photos of Angela Lansbury in her like twenties, and, and like like she was like like yeah. a really beautiful woman. Um, I, I think so. Um, but I also have this like, you know, affection towards her. So like maybe it's just my own biasness. Yeah. Um, you know, she she has a more minor part. Like she does a good like yeah, she has a couple of bits. Bits. Um, I like it when she comes back as like like an actual pirate. You know, she's not in her she's nanny in uniform. She's in, and she's like the most decorated of all of them. It, it's like it, it's great. I don't know why it's, it's so like funny a, to a me. straight out outfit that you would see as a, the other ones are very very minimal and hers is very um, overboard. Right. But uh, also, I want to mention. Geez, I had something that I was thinking of. Oh, how well Kevin Klein can move. Yeah, he is so flexible, and you see him doing the old Russian dance at one point mm-hmm. in the bottom of the corner of the screen. It's not even like focused on. But when they do the dance, the little like squint down and kick your legs. I do it, but it, like, obviously you won't see me do it, and <laughs> I won't do it well enough, and I'll probably hurt my back. But yeah, it does all those movements very well. Him and the uh, constable were the were probably moving the best, as well as mm-hmm. uh, Frederick. They moved really well, surprisingly well. Um, but yeah, it's really cute. It's really funny. It's entertaining, and the sets are great. I love when um, you show um, Major uh, wandering around, and you see like the uh, the pirates sneaking up on him, right. trying to stay stealthy, and they're in the water and all that kind of stuff. Um, He's yeah. like frolicking in a field, you know. Um, the the major is yeah. and. Uh, yeah, he, he's fantastic, um, and his number is, like, I think the one that anybody Everybody would know. Would we, we mentioned the major generals. Right, thing. yeah. Um, one thing I also mentioned, like, watching stuff like this, I know that The Hobbit was obviously a, a book and everything like that, but watching the, the movie version of Hobbit, and the book's very minimal in, in description, while the film is so descriptive and so detail-oriented and all the characters have their own quirks and stuff, watching this, it's like, I feel like Del Toro probably is a big fan of this one because the pirates have such detail and they're in the background, and you recognize all the pirates even if you don't know their names or they don't have names set in the, in the script, but I feel like The Hobbit had that kind of feeling, too with all this magical kind of characters even though they're very small and the first Hobbit only the sex sequels are kind of trash bags to me but the first one I thought was a really special movie right um, I think that this... Del, although Del Toro did direct it he had a hand in it right yes um, I, I, you know when you're looking at, at this musical I think specifically this production um, I think you see it, this is kind of like, like when in the t- period of musicals as far as musical goes and this is more like an opera than a musical but I think it's when they start getting good. I don't particularly care for musicals of the 50s or 60s uh, that much. I'm not very versed in them, but um, I, I like a lot of the 70s and 80s ones that I've seen. Yeah, you know, this is the beginning of the 80s, so we're starting to get into, like, the rock musical, Andrew Lloyd Webber's, you know, coming around, although he probably already did Jesus Christ Superstar. You know, and we also have the, the kind of horror ones, like Rocky Horror, right. and Phantom of Paradise, and Shock Treatment, which I think are all really fun and entertaining. Right. And then when we get to the 90s, I think late 90s, we start getting, like, the spoofy ones, like the right. Right. Park guys start doing theirs like Cannibal the Musical, mm-hmm. and we even have stuff later on like Stage Fright, the 2010 one, which is a really cool movie, and and the trauma shit like Poultry Guys. Poultry so guys. I, I feel like when uh, musicals start almost being parodied or they take different genres, when they add in the rock and fusion, I think that helped a great deal. For I me. think it does, and especially Phantom of Paradise and Rocky mm-hmm. Horror. I think it really did. Absolutely, shock treatment and um, self aware too, self aware right. and parodying modern culture and stuff like that. And, and that's what this is. It's very tongue in cheek. It is not a serious musical. It's it's not like you're going to be watching Les Mis or Evita, you know. And it's, I do like Les Mis. Um, oh, I love actually those the too. musical itself, not right. not the 2012 movie version. Yeah, it wasn't too big on that. That does have some good moments, like Anne Hathaway. And right. I, I really like Russell Crowe and Hugh Jackman. I just don't think that their singing, talking mm-hmm. voice is very effective. You know, this, I think that this music, musical in general, this Pirates of uh, Penzance, I think it's like the go-to musical. Whenever, whenever somebody has to spoof pirates, they go to this. Um, whenever they have to spoof musicals, I feel like that they go to this one. I think it pops up in a lot of, like... It, it even spoofs itself in this movie, so the the constables are chasing the pirates, and they happen onto a stage, and it's 
it's sort of pirates and daughters and sailors and daughters, you know. Um, it so sort of like I know Bob's Burgers boosted in one episode, which is awesome. I bet Simpsons does. I'm sure Simpsons does. Simpsons um, did it. I I've seen uh, <laughs> I I've seen this production twice. Um, once was at my high school, and unfortunately it was after I. I graduated, so I couldn't take part in it. Um, but it's just an all-around fun musical. The music's great. I feel like when you look at um, Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean, I think he looks at uh, Kevin Klein a lot. I mean, Pirates in Pirate. his acting. Pirates a Pirate, you know, but like like the the oh. the the way that he moves on the the eccentricness yeah. of Kevin Klein. I think it's done over. It's done to an eleven with Johnny Depp, but um, I, I you can see like the train of thought going to it. Does that make sense? Do you see I don't, that? I don't, I don't know. know. I only saw part of Pirates of the Caribbean. I've only seen the first one. I have no interest in watching I, anything else. I, I don't know. I'm fine. I'd watch them, but i just never seen them. And yeah. They're also very long. And they're I'm very long. long. Yeah. So um, the one thing that I thought was um, very funny is when he's uh, at the uh, Frederick has to confess because he's now a pirate again and he has to be dutiful. And he's talking to um, Kevin Klein and um, Angela Lansbury and he's whispering to them. And he's like, he... Mentioned that he was a he convinced you guys not to uh, do any harm to him because he was an orphan and Kevin Klein's like what he's all outraged and he's like oh yeah I already knew that yesterday yeah <laughs> that part was really funny um anyways very entertaining I mean I don't know how to rate this typically as a first time watch I, I'd be like four out of five on it or something along those lines I give it you know I I really like it you know um it is you know so this is like a musical that's it's not shot like it's on stage but it is um presented like it's on stage yeah you know so it's a movie it's not like a stage recording yeah, it's not a stage recording there's um, lots of great sets and movements and everything and the camera the stage work is fantastic right. the marks are great the chore the choreograph stuff the composition that kind of stuff is very excellent right um, you could just imagine how hard it was for people like to hit their marks because when it pulls out the camera they're in the exact spots with stuff in the foreground that pretty much paces and sets the frame perfectly right and this is kind of like a halfway point between, like, you know, a stage recording of, like, Wicked or Phantom of the Opera and a full-on musical production, like a Vito Le Mez, uh, Schumacher's Phantom of the Opera. It's, like, kind of like that in-between space, and I don't feel like we get a lot of these. Um, I really enjoy it. I love the music, so, like, in my heart, I'm going to give it a five. Maybe when you're watching, because I know there are some slow bits, I think it's kind of slow at the start, um, and the second act is maybe a little bit too long in, in certain scenes. Um, but I, like, you're going to enjoy it. I give it a five. It's probably more like a four. Um, I mean, I, I'm not, like I said, I have nothing to compare it to as far as the source material is concerned. So I enjoyed my time with it. Right. Um, next week, uh, I'm probably going to pick a 1970 movie. Okay. Cause I'm doing the 70, 1970. And there's one that I think that you would enjoy. And I think it would be very much interest to you because we watched all the hammer Dracula's with the man, Christopher Lee. Mm -hmm. And we've watched so many gothic horror movies. We've watched so many renditions of Frankenstein and Dracula. It's become a point now where we're interested in how they handle the source material, how they do it. And this one is a Jess Franco film. And I know people are like, Jess Franco! You just reviewed a Jess Franco movie last week and you hated it! From Spider-Man? Stop. Okay. That's not funny. So <laughs> Jess, I hate when people blow my concentration. I'm in the middle of a fucking diet. You're okay. Like Go All right. So Jess Franco, basically, you know, he has a very long, illustrious career and a some really shoddy stuff towards the end of his life. Um, but early in his career, it's not the same kind of Jess Franco. He had budgets and everything. So I want to do uh, Jess Franco's Count Dracula, which is one that Christopher Lee agreed to do, even though he was in the middle of doing the Hammer Draculas, because he could actually use dialogue from the Bram Stoker novel, which kind of excited Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee has a mustache in the film, which is not necessarily rare for him to have strange mm -hmm. facial hair if we see like the gorgon i think he has like the mustache in that yes, as well right. uh, but this time it's dracula <coughs> with a mustache to make sure we knew it wasn't part of the hammer series <laughs> um also i think claus kinski's in it if i'm not mistaken that might Is be a mistake it? i want to say he's renfield but that can completely be out of it but i do it's been a very long time since i've watched it um and that's why i'm looking forward to rewatching it as well and also herbert lom has van helsing so okay. and in the very first half of this movie i remember it being very close to bram stoker's novel I think it kind of goes out the window a little bit, but I remember being immensely impressed that Jess Franco, of all people, was the one to hold truer to the fucking source material than anyone else ever did. Mm -hmm. um, so, I wonder if uh, Christopher Lee has ever been with, um, who's that little guy, like... Peter Lorre? Yeah. I Peter don't Lord. think so. I'm not sure. Like, the problem, he might have been, like, but it, it hits the point where, like, 
I know Laurie was obviously with Price and everything, um, and Lon Chaney got to work with Price too in the Haunted mm-hmm. Palace. So it's hard to like, and Boris Karloff worked with Price. Price was that kind of gateway because he was an American. So, mm-hmm. and Laurie lived in America, and before I don't know if he ever had a chance to work with Lee when he was, you know. That's but a shame. It, I don't know. He died pretty young. So, and, right. you know what I mean? A lot of those horror, like, actors died. I'll have to look it up. I know Lee worked with Pleasance, and he worked with Herbert Lom, and he worked with John Carradine, and Peter Cushing, and Vincent Price, and a lot of the big names. Donald Pleasance, of course, and Raw Meat. So he worked with a lot of the big names. Right. And uh, Price worked with almost all of them, too. So there's, yeah. a, there's that House of Long Shadows that has four of the fucking guys in it. So right. it's pretty easy to compare them there. So, yeah, uh... Anyways, I'm looking forward to rewatching that one, and I want to say Klaus Kinski's in it. I don't want to be mistaken. I think we'll find out. I, I hope he is. <laughs> but can you imagine that set? <laughs> oh no, Klaus Kinski wasn't in with um, Christopher Lee in that Hammer one. That no, was Klaus daughter, Kinski was right? never in a Hammer movie. No, never in a Hammer movie. He was almost into The Devil a Daughter, but they couldn't work it out. Right, which and was that's what one his daughter's in it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, so you know they had to interact. I mean, if his daughter was in it. We'll see. I, I maybe I'm making a mistake. I want to say he's in it. I hope he's in. It. I'm <laughs> hoping he's in it. Like I said, it's been like 15 to 20 years since I've seen the damn thing. Anyways, I know Severn has a Blu-ray of it. Um, and I'm looking forward to checking that. Are you excited to watch it? I know Christopher Lee played Dracula one more time besides the Hammer movies and that one he played in. I think a uh, comedy uh, Dracula, Dracula really? and his son or something like that, which I have not seen. So he played Dracula nine times and only seven times in the Hammer films. He wasn't in two of them. And he Brides did Dracula, and he was not in Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. And he did um, hint at his Dracula performance in Gremlins too. The yes, new but that was a deleted scene where he said, "I heard." I know. I always blood. forget that was a deleted scene. It shouldn't have been because it's one of the finest moments. It Anyways, is. we're okay, done. Okay, we're done. Very nice indeed. I'm told they sometimes feed on blood. Oh, uh, that's a different kind of bad doctor. Uh, South American. Oh. Well, keep up the good work, Wallace. Okay, let's get into these questions, answers, and comments. Dead Flintstone. Okay, so basically I asked you, um, what did I ask? Oh, any actor or actress that you would have a dream role to play as any character or anything like that. They can be dead or alive, any time time frame, just throw them in a movie. So, Dead Flintstone, Ivan Reitman was toying with the idea of making a Batman movie in the 80s, which would star Bill Murray as Batman and David Bowie as the Joker. That idea would have been kind of amazing. I agree, that would have been very interesting. Hi, kid. I watched both Neon Demon and Raw in theater when they first released. I enjoyed both of them. The music, colors, and cinematography of Neon Demon was fantastic, and I loved Jenna Malone in it. And Keanu Reeves was pretty good as the creepy motel owner. Raw was a nice slow burn flick and had a great ending. David Leather, Jeremy is so wrong about Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Um, Ilk Vomit. As far as nowadays westerns go, Brimstone is a masterpiece. If you want to, anyone here has been holding off on checking it out, do yourself a favor and watch this movie tonight. I believe it's free on to watch on Tubi. They also show it a lot on Pluto TV. Just the past week, well, when browsing Pluto, I came across it three times. Three times. Isimisio. Um, Neon Demon blew me away the first time I saw it in Nighthawk in Brooklyn. Might have been the atmosphere and probably because I was also drinking during the movie. But subsequent watches didn't really have the same initial impact and it grew to be more average over time. I do love the visuals and music in the film though. Raw is okay to me. There are truly certain moments in the film that make me want to go Mr. Parker rant. The craziness slash hazing of the school, the uninvolved parents, and the gradual breakthrough of her new craving. I could see that especially because like at, at, like the hazing at that point, you're just like somebody's getting killed here. Or me or them are dying. And then um, the uninvolved parents, you think like they are involved where they're sending them to school, but you think with all the problems, they would probably a little bit more helicopter parents and then the gradual breakdown of her new craving and how about the fact that she got her mattress tossed out the window like two three times someone did that to me i'd be like fuck that shit and fuck this school don't touch my fucking mattress she just takes it like an ordinary thing oh there's my mattress on the ground outside let me lug this baby all the way back up the stairs to my room we i'd be trying to throw them out there if that happened so mood 616 no corrections this can't be life dick and fart jokes will sign me up i love dude pro martin dude Bro Party Massacre 3. Ha ha ha. How do we ever laugh on our show? I don't know. Because, like, I do like some stupid jokes like that, but no, I guess not in a movie. Not all the time. Kentuckinator. Jeremy, lick my plate. Sherlock Horror. So many possible answers to this week's question, but I'll go with my all-time favorite actor, Donna Pleasance, who would have been perfect to play the Penguin in a Batman movie. But hell, I'd watch him play the Joker, the Riddler, Batman, and even Catwoman. Speaking of Pleasance, on a modern, more modern note, if they were ever to remake Halloween again, I've always thought Iridus Elba 
uh, would be ideal for Dr. Loomis' role. Looking forward to checking out Bramson. Guy Pierce is brilliant and underrated actor. It flew under my most people's radar when it came out, so good to hear a positive review from a trusted source. Let me know how what you think. I thought it was pretty great. Zach Nolan. I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 on video in 1987 when I was 12. I remember I wasn't allowed to see an NC-17 movie in the theater. I see some comedy in it, but to this day, I still I feel, I think it is still visceral and brutal. Stretch wearing LG's face is so sick. I embrace Hooper's film as being pure, original, batshit cinema. Some people may be surprised that Stanley Kubrick was a huge Hooper fan. I don't know. He's a smart man. Uh, Nick Mua, isn't the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 the most beautifully bizarre masterpiece ever made? That's my feeling, at least after multiple viewings. Also, I'm glad you re-reviewed Super Dark Times, an excellent disturbed youth evil kids movie. It makes me doubt, doubly happy to have it added in my collection. Question of the week. Were I a time wizard, I would love to click my heels and have Vincent Price in Lord of the Rings trilogy, preferably as Dinathor. Mr. Price would be excellent as a somewhat demented father who loves his children. Also, had they made X-Men films in the 40s or 50s, Ruby D, the stand, cat people, would have been perfect for Storm, as electric performances guaranteed. Pun intended. Questions. In both adaptations of Stephen King's It, the part with the adults seems to be less effective than the part featuring the kids. Do you agree? If so, why do you think that is? Yes, I do agree. I think that um, it's scarier to be in a situation like that as a kid and i think it initially brings a response from you and it just the the old the child parts in it just make you feel remember your childhood therefore kind of reminisce it and add yourself in the situation easier than as an adult maybe possibly i feel like it's easier to be scared when a kid is involved in the situation and it's just better made better put together um, do you always upgrade if a film you already own is re-released? Depends on the release. If it's a movie I don't really care for, I probably won't. When watching Pee Pee Tom, I always feel sad that the film pretty much ended Michael Powell's career as a director. Why was this film so reviled at the time, do you think? Well, voyeurism was a big no-no. It was kind of a fetish, a taboo at the time. So voyeurism was kind of really put down on. I remember a Playboy article back in the 60s or 70s or something that somebody mentioned that, like, I remember hearing about this. I might have even read it online, where Lee Marvin basically mentioned and he basically said, I don't get why people even care about homosexuality. Now, voyeurism is really the main kind of thing he was talking. And he mentioned that. And it's kind of strange to think that um, that voyeurism, which is pretty much in all fucking horror films now, was such a no-no at the time. Lastly, I know you feel a bit mad towards Haunted House flicks. And there are plenty of stinkers in the genre. Still, if you ever had a couple hours to kill, please, please consider watching the Enfield Haunting. The version of the Enfield Poltergeist story is much richer and good deal more creepy than the Hollywood version. Helly weird version. And who could say no to the top-notch performance by Timothy Spall? Dream Demon, Last Samurai, Phil Ridley's Heartless. Monster Mania, Monster Movie Man 13. On Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Dave tell Jeremy that the production and visuals alone deserve to make this movie a 2 out of 5, even if he hates the story and all the characters. The movie is stupid, goofy, bloody comfort food. Fun for me. Claire Bear, Puss Puss wants to be in the video too. Well, they got in there. David Luton, Liverpool-born actor Stephen Graham in the um, uh, Maurizio Merley role in Rome, Armed to the Teeth. Southport Rocker, might try and have to have a look at Lieutenant Jangles, film not far from where I live. Cool. You Ain't Seen is getting funnier. The back and forth between you both is hilarious at times. Great segment. Great reviews as always. Thank you. The Mystagog. Your Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 review with Jeremy is one of the best disagreement slash interactions ever. It was too funny. I laughed so many times. It's funny because Jeremy's criticisms are totally valid, but I'm with Mr. Parker. Texas Chainsaw 2 is super fun. If one forgets how the movie embodies a good slap in the face of the 80s, the original poster mocks The Breakfast Club. I love that poster. Mike Merriman, Jerry Lewis as the Joker. Jason Fetters, I would love to see Bruce Lee in a 90s era Hong Kong action movie in his prime. He was the quintessential action hero, so I wonder if he would incorporate guns and crazy stunts. Alan Blyton, Charles Bronson and Clint Eastwood to meet in a Death Wish Dirty Harry crossover. That would be awesome. Brad Veach, Sid Hag as Grandpa Joe and Charlie in a Chocolate Factory. And then people start making these funny quotes. Gabrielle Jewett uh, says, Shut the fuck up, Charlie, you little shithead grandpa's eating chicken. And uh, Brad Veach replies, this ain't no goddamn candy factory unless you got some tootie fucking fruity. Okay. Matthew Hudson, I know at least two people in our circle are going to say Vincent Price is Dr. Strange. Personally, I'd really like to see Dick Miller in a Philip K. Dick adaptation. Because in his written works, his protagonists are kind of rough around the edges and a bit more morally ambiguous, especially when compared to films based on his stuff. I could actually see him as a protagonist from the story Paycheck. The Ben Affleck movie is extremely different from the short story. I could see Miller doing something really awesome with the main characters. He's written in a short story, Stan Moreland. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is it written in the short story? And then we have Stan Moreland, uh, Tura Santana, and a twisted remake of Auntie May. 
uh, Joachim Johansson, Timothy Dalton as Quatermass. That's a great choice. Michael Fisher, uh, Fisher, um, K, uh, Caleb Laundry Jones as the Joker. Very cool. Uh, Jason, uh, Michael Willard, Bruce Lee as a Shang-Chi. Michael Merriman, Philip Seymour Hoffman, just not being dead, period, already. Fuck. Skip Barber, you and the Last Temptation of Christ. Okay. Cody Lee Hart, Victor Salva as John Wayne Gacy. Accurate. Matthew Canther, Robin Williams as the Mad Hatter in a Batman movie. Sadie Tate, Sharon Tate as Rosemary in Rosemary's Baby. Uh, Gabrielle Jewett, uh, I agree, great pick. Seb Godin, Jeremy Irons as Jekyll and Hyde, great pick. Glenn G. Worthington, Robin Williams as the Riddler. Uh, Marine Kern Fairbairn, Clark Gable as Batman. That would have been awesome. Derek B., uh, Robin Williams as Hugo Strange. William Adcock, Brian Blessed as Professor Challenger in an adaptation of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World. Jordan Bibby, Vincent Price as Doctor Strange. Corey Walter, John Lithgow taking John Voight's place in Anaconda. Kevin Keegan, Don Knotts as Dirty Harry. Derek B., Tommy Lee Jones as Gandalf and or Ganondorf, sorry, in a Legend of Zelda movie. Justin Koch, first thought for some reason, John Ritter as Paul Lynn. Troy Howarth, Christopher Lee as Don Quixote, love it. Max von Sydow as Professor Van Helling, love it. Lee Van Cleef as Dracula, interesting. Sherman Hirsch, Shirley Temple as James Bond. Hmm. Ryan Matthew Ziegler, Angus Scrim as Scrooge, good choice. Rob Kozinski or Kozinski. George Eastman as Michael Myers in Halloween 2018. That would have been cool. Derek B., Peter Boyle as Dr. Loomis. Jonathan Wilhelm, Chris Farley as Slimer. Salvador Funkenstein, Tommy Wiseau as Eric Draven, the crow. Yuri Nakankurliki, Ron Smuigenberg in the role of comic book Storm as Storm after the Don Lawrence comics. Yuri, and he also says Commandant Greek. Um, so basically here we're going to get into next week's question. And I might have asked this before, but I want to know which two actors would you love to see work together, alive or dead? So I always wanted, I would have liked to see Charles Bronson work with Clint Eastwood. Bronson worked with Burt Reynolds. There's so many combinations here. Uh, just two actors, alive or dead, or actresses, whoever you want to see um, in a movie together. So there we go. And I guess we're going to hop into the update. All right, so I got my big... Uh... Black Friday vinegar syndrome or halfway to Black Friday sale. So let's hop into this. And the first one is uh, La Femme Object, um, which I did not get the deluxe edition. I just picked up the regular edition. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know much about this. It is a porno film, but it has a star. This lady's in a bunch of uh, French horror films and a lot of uh, softcore, hardcore stuff too. So pick this one up. She's in some Jean Roland films. So what else do we got here? We got Alien from L.A., which I think I had a DVD of this years back. I don't think I ever got a chance to watch it. Looks like we got some 80s punks in here. Looking late 80s. I think it's more of a comedy film. Never actually seen this one. Hopefully that glare is not too bad. Then we got... Um, I'm trying to get all the Vinegar Syndrome titles first. We got Surf 2, which this movie is ridiculous. This is such a fun, goofy movie. If you guys never seen Surf 2, um, there is no Surf 1. But yeah, it's it's going to be awesome to rewatch Surf 2. Um, I guess there's a director's cut on here, which I've never seen. I never imagined that Surf 2 would be on Blu-ray in a deluxe awesome edition like this with a director's cut. Um, it's a weird movie, guys. Um, so then we have... Uh, a VS Archive. We have uh, Scanner Cop 1 and 2. That's right. Um, these movies are cool. I think they're better than the other Scanner movies, to be honest. So Scanner Cop has, um, if I remember correctly, Richard Lynch is the baddie. These are sequels. These are 4Ks, and these are sequels to the original Scanner's films. So then we also have Scanner uh, Cop 2 with Patrick Kilpatrick as the baddie in here. Love Patrick, Patrick Kilpatrick. A staple in the 80s and 90s as a goon. So another 4K. It, it's insane to think. Like, this is what's so messed up about, like, I, I like these kind of movies. But we have 4Ks of Scanner Cop 1 and 2. And literally, like, there's not even a Blu-ray of, tr of uh, True Lies. Like... The companies don't deserve the movies they own. I know it. Like they don't even deserve them. I know they pay for them, but still, they don't. They don't treat them right. So then we have the Cardona uh, collection, which has three films on there. I've seen Cyclone, 
Cyclone's a pretty cool movie. Synapse put out a, a Blu-ray years back. So yeah, this set is also pretty damn cool. It's got a slip cover in there. So we got Collection Volume 1. Also, what else is on here? So we have um, Cyclone, Treasure of the Amazon, and Triangle. The Bermuda Mystery. So yeah, it's so weird to have like a, a side cover and then a slip cover. It's just like pretty much there's going to be like one of those like Russian dolls where you keep opening it to get your movie, like 30 different covers on here. What else do we got? We have the television tear set, which is pretty cool. I love these boxes. They're awesome. Is that Elijah Wood on the front there? I think it is. We got Are You Alone in the House, Calendar Girl Murders, and Child in the Night. Which are three movies that I'm vaguely familiar with the titles, but I don't think I've ever watched any of them. Child in the Night, Tom Skerritt, and Elijah Wood looks like on the cover there. Are You Alone in the House? 1978, very cool. And The Calendar uh, Girl Murders. So this one I think I remember seeing the cover here, and that's the 1980s. So is this one a 90s? We got a 70s, 80s, and a 90s. Yeah, we do. Very cool. Put those bad boys away. Vinegar Syndrome, hands down. Just killing it. And it, I like the yearly subscription deal, too, because, like, you save money, you buy it, you don't worry about it. Although some of the stuff you do eventually have to kind of, like, remember to, like, get their, like, um, their brother-sister label stuff. So then we have Six String Samurai. Which I've seen. It's definitely a cult film. Man, these, these things are insane. Like, look at these things. They do such a good job on these. It's it's a book here and a slipcover. Everything is like another 4K. Everything is like 40 slipcovers here. So, like I said, like pretty soon you're just going to be going through layers and layers and layers of slipcovers. i just be buying slipcovers. Like, I'd never just buy a slipcover. But having it, it, it is nice. I'm not going to lie. But I just never purchase anything for that. Then we have the video. Um, let's do the archives. I forgot to pick this one up, so it came with this one. Grave Secrets, which I had on VHS for years. And I believe I might have watched this at one point. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah. Grave Secrets, Rest in Pieces, and Possession Until Death Do We Part were three covers that always reminded me of each other. So we have Alley Cat, which I believe is a Canadian film. And I had a DVD from Scorpion. It's a cool illustrated cover there. Um, yeah, in the back here. It's more like an exploitation style thing. In the 80s. I think it is the 80s. And then we have Champagne and Bullets, which is uh, Get Even, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I've heard them talk about this. Uh, Elric Kane talk about Get Even, which is this weird, bizarre vanity project. But who's in here? William Smith, Wings Hauser, and this, this guy who like produced it and probably directed it. Um, yeah, he's in it. So I've never seen it. Looks absolutely ridiculous. Then we have a couple more here. We have Walking the Edge with Robert Forrester and Joe Spinell, which is a movie I've always wanted to watch. The DVD was long out of print. It was from Anchor Bay. So they drove him to the edge. And the edge, there are no rules. That's right. Sounds like maybe a little bit of a, a sister-brother or whatever piece with uh, Vigilante with Robert Forrester and Joe Spinell as well. And then we have um, The Leather Boys from Agfa. Shout, along with Shout. It's pretty crazy. Never seen them. I'm sure they worked together before, but I didn't know. Still a couple Agfas I still need to pick up eventually. And the last of the four uh, Blu-rays is a, uh, Adoration, which is by the same guy who um, did um, Calvair and Hallelujah, which I've seen Hallelujah. And this cover just caught my attention, and I thought that Aliyah was a interesting enough film to grab this one. So I'll have to watch Calvera. Believe it or not, I've never seen it. So I guess this one finishes out a trilogy. Now we have some DVDs, which I'll be quick with, which I just grabbed because the sale and everything are good price. We have a Picarama Big Three Unit, Red Heat, Hot Vampire, and Peeping Tom.
Got some doubles here. Bloodthirst and the Thirsty Dead. Judy and Night Hustlers. Some Judy down the back of there. Hopefully I won't get too flagged. Oop. Then we have Dark Dreams, Tale of Erotic Fantasy. And last, Knight of the Strangler. He gets them all. Mickey Dolans. What the hell? So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's everything. We're going to hop back to the video. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a good one. Thanks.